It's four o'clock on th- <clears throat> four o'clock on Thursday. <laughs> it's time for another exciting episode of Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour. Woo-hoo! Yeah, baby. Woo-hoo! It's a two woohoo day. <laughs> Uh, thank you, fake band. Thank you, fake audience. Let's see who's in that chat room. Hello, Akira Canyon, Dan Weber, Bob Gunnerfeld, Jesse J. Peck, Ian Shortle, Shortall, Darren Fletcher, Rick, Rick Cabot, Podmore, Nancy Collell. Woohoo is right, Bob. <laughs> How are you guys? Good to see you. Whoop, a little out of focus. There we go. Now everything's in focus. Time for keeping up with the taxi dash ins. <laughs> there you go. Uh, let me get situated. My chair is rolling all over the place. All right. Hello, Il Rosso, Andre. Um, yeah, my computer, I'm, I think I'm going to have to buy a new computer. Uh, this one, for some reason now, even though I've got it set on the right setting for doing the big show. Um, it's pushing the CPU rather hard and uh, it's heating it up. Uh, yeah, yesterday's show was great. Rich was a great guest. That guy, man, he and I can talk endlessly, uh, which we usually do. Frankly, uh, you know, when we talk to each other just on a personal level, I mean, it always ends up being industry stuff and we do talk forever. Um, yes, Peter Rahill, the 11th like. Everybody, go smash that like button now. Ooh, Lemoncello. Nice. Hello, Dave Merkel, Mark Reel. Cass, how are you? Goatman is here. Pete Mason, Darren Fletcher, Just Falonzo. Hey, hey, we will write you a song. Hello. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. That's everybody. Well, Martin Gravel, Ken Bearden. <laughs> All right, so let's call this episode What Really Pisses Michael Lasko Off. (laughs) Haven't done one of these in a long time. So about an hour ago, I got an email from Tom, who is the head of our A&R department. Um, This was sent back to him. Excuse me after Taxi forwarded um, a bunch of music to a library owner. Um, Hey Tom, just letting you know I signed contracts with about 40 composers so far, so thanks for all the great stuff. Looking forward to more great artists and other genres. Thanks again, man. Best library owner name. So, 40 composers got signed to this library. Do you know how many of those composers let us know Goose eggs. Why? Why can't taxi members tell us when they sign deals? Why? I don't know. Anyway, it's frustrating. Um, And and frankly, we don't often hear from uh, the people in the industry, this guy's nice enough that he sends us emails. I mean, some do, you know, but most don't because they're really busy but we'd really appreciate it if uh, our members would say, hey, I got a forward turned into a deal. Um, Just let us know. You can send an email to any of the email addresses at taxi.com. You could send it to taxitv at taxi.com. You could send it to member services at taxi.com. You know, just please let us know. We'd like to know that you guys are getting deals. We like to brag about it, frankly. <laughs> so what do you guys want to do today? I have been jamming all day. I know that uh, Ariana is waiting for me to get back to her on a series of emails. Sorry, Ari. <laughs> Haven't gotten to him yet. Uh, it just was one of those days where stuff was just raining down on me and continues to do so. So I really didn't plan anything for today's show. Um, Rick says, if I get a deal, if I get a deal, everyone will know just biding my time. Thank you, Rick. Um, yep, Mark, it's hard to believe they don't let us know. 
Well, Ren's got a forward. That's good. But uh, yeah, uh, go ahead and post that in the forward section of the forum at forums with an S, forums.taxi.com. Um, so there you go. Uh, I just got off the phone about five minutes ago with um, a video editor. Um, and he's going to join me on the show coming up probably next week. Um, he's got a, well, his wife has a bun in the oven, and uh, so he couldn't lock anything in just yet. Um, it's funny, during our phone conversation and when I was asking him to do the show with me, he said, well, yeah, you know, there's some stuff I, I wouldn't want to let people know. And I said, like, what? Because, you know, we're all about being honest and transparent. And he said, well, you know, when editors are working on a show, uh, you know, we could have five or ten libraries, you know, in the bin. And uh, each of them could have a couple thousand tracks, uh, you know. So I don't want people to feel discouraged, like there's no chance of them getting heard. And I said, no, they need to know that stuff. Um, it will help them work on things like... Uh, titling their cues better so that they telegraph, uh, you know, what the music is going to sound like. And he went, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and then he said, yeah, but they probably shouldn't know that when we're editing and we're auditioning uh, the stuff to dump in with picture that we might only listen to a few seconds and then skip to the next one and the next one and the next one. And it's not until we hear something that immediately says, I'm a possibility, um, do we bother to look at it against picture? And I said, no, they need to know that stuff. I've told them that a hundred times. They know already, but tell them again. Um, he's got a bun in her oven. Where's the social distancing? Well, I'm pretty sure that that bun was planted in the oven um, sometime before COVID showed up. Uh, Darren Moss, by head. <laughs> Bad. Uh, guilty as charged. They signed a deal from Taxi last year with a publisher in the UK. I guess I put it in the submit and forget category. Thought I would contact uh, when the song ends up getting used somewhere. Uh, you know, let us know that you got a deal. Sure, we'd love to hear, hear about placements as well, of course. Um, Andre is going to miss the show tomorrow because he's going fly fishing and camping for 10 pound rainbows. Whoa, 10 pound rainbow trout. I thought that they were all like, you know, that big. Well, it looks big on camera. That's about a foot. I thought rainbow trout were like, you know, a pound. Um, yeah, jealous. Maybe I'll take tomorrow off and fly up there and go with you. <laughs> oh, man. So jealous. I'm not going to be able to think about anything else for the rest of the show. Wow. Um, so when you go camping, do they have like, you know, um, heavenly beds from the Westin and air conditioned tents and private toilets, all that kind of stuff? I actually do like camping. I used to do it a lot when I was younger. I was like, you know, in the Boy Scouts and then after the Boy Scouts, probably between the ages of 10 and 14 years old because I grew up in a farm community. Uh, we would talk our parents into uh, taking three or four of us that were all Boy Scouts because we knew what we were doing, you know, uh, and dropping us off somewhere out in the boonies and letting us uh, find a place and camp and stay out overnight. Um, always fun. And I have camped a couple times as an adult. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Andre says, no, he doesn't go to places like that. Uh, there are places like that, but I do hardcore camping and cook nothing like it. Um, yeah, have I mentioned I love to cook? I'm a pretty darn good cook if I do say so myself um, having fish for dinner tonight we are having um, coconut curry uh, oh I forget what's I can't think uh, halibut coconut curry halibut done on the grill with um, grilled 
tomatoes and something else. Can't remember. Anyway, um, things that make Michael angry. Do I? Do you get angry? Yeah, you know, we all get angry at something sooner or later. Um, camping at a music festival, not so much fun. Uh, we're here at the ta taxi campgrounds throwing our lures into the water of music. Corny. <laughs> Uh, let's see, should we do more things? <laughs> Are we doing more things that piss Michael off? Let me think about that. You know, honestly, not a whole lot really does piss me off, but I do get upset by that because it's been this way for 28 years. I mean, nothing worse than being at the road rally and I'm running from the ballroom to the restroom uh, to take care of business before I have to be back on stage in like three minutes and somebody stops me on the way to the restroom or sometimes even in the restroom standing there taking care of business and they say, hey, by the way, I want to let you know I got a deal last year. Oh, man, why didn't you tell us? Uh, I don't know, I just forgot. Well, send us an email after the rally, will you? Well, let, let me just tell you about it now. Well, you can tell me about it now, but I'm kind of busy and I'm, chances are I'm not going to remember it. Um, so please just shoot us an email to any of the taxi addresses saying, can you let the people that need to know this know that I got a deal? Any address. Cass, that's not dinner, that's dessert. I guess you're talking about the uh, coconut curry halibut? Darren Moss, uh, I'm sorry, I'll finally join the forums and post up the deal. Thank you, Darren. Uh, Matt Bantle, boy, you nailed that one. I assume the most frustrating thing for Michael must be responding to people who question whether taxi is legit. Yeah, you know, that is a sore subject. After... Uh, 28 years, you'd think people would get it, um, but they don't, you know, they hear about it word of mouth. All it takes is one person, oh, taxi charges people money to join, therefore they're evil. Um, and then they tell another person and it spreads geometrically and all these people are out there that really have no idea what we do, how we do it, how well we do it how transparent we are, or how many people have gotten deals or had their lives changed because of what we do. And uh, yeah, they post this stuff on the internet and it stays there forever. And then somebody's thinking about joining Taxi and they Google, you know, to find out stuff about Taxi and they see those negative posts that were probably made by people who've never even been a member. Or of course, there's always the classic uh, I used Taxi about 10 years ago and they didn't do anything good for me. I think that they should make it a law that if you post anything negative about Taxi or that thing specifically where people say, uh, yeah, Taxi didn't do anything for me, post a link to your music because 99% of the time you listen to the music and you go, oh, now I understand why nothing happened to them uh, when they were using Taxi. Um, Hello, Lisa Dunn. Uh, thank you for saying the ways we support our members is incredible. Thank you. Um, Joseph Alonzo says it's because there are a couple of other companies that are shady. There are, you know, frankly, I've never really loved that. Um, honestly, I don't know of another company that does the kind of thing that we do that is frankly as good as we are, that's as honest and hardworking and uh, gets real listings, which are pretty critical, um, has real screeners with incredible resumes. And yeah, I mean, you know, there have been companies that I'm well aware of, some, you know, where I've actually known the, the people who own them. And uh, how can I, I've got to make sure I don't get sued by saying this. Uh, there are companies out there that just run fake listings. Um, Somebody who used to work at Taxi uh, went to work for another company because it was about a block away from where he lived and he really wanted to be able to walk to work. So he left Taxi on good terms and uh, went to work at that company. And then uh, I, I heard from a little birdie that uh, a particular company was, you know, somebody brought up at one of their meetings, why, why are we making up all these 
fake listings? And, and the answer that that person got was because we don't have any real ones. So yeah, they were actually putting out fake listings and people were submitting music and the music that was forwarded was getting forwarded to nowhere. Um, Joseph Alonzo, there was one that closed down, yep. Um, <laughs> now I think you're as smart as we can, Beard. Just, just <laughs> that was a little corny line there. Uh, Robert Martin says the road rally alone is worth the membership price. Uh, thank you for saying that. Um, Mark Real Taxi is A plus plus plus. Tempted to give away names of those fake listing companies. Um, and yeah, don't do it here in this chat, but man, you know, I'm not going to stop you. Um, I, I'm just amazed, you know, and it does bum me out because it, it hurts us by extension. Um, let's see, many years ago, I was featured in the taxi newsletter with Kenny Kerner, uh, but they're so old, they're no longer there. Will those be back up? Uh, it depends. Uh, in answer to your question, Darren, we had something like 1,600 articles that were on the old website. Um, and my wife has actually been working in the background now for several months, actually, um, converting. They, all that stuff uh, had to be converted over to a new format and have a bunch of uh, um, URL changes and have a bunch of HTML changes. So she's been working with our uh, web dev guys and she just completed that project about a week or so ago. So yeah, slowly but surely, all those things are coming back over to the website. Um, uh, video stopped. Uh, everything's good here. That's funny. My computer is running hot. It says I'm only using 9% of my CPU. Interesting. Uh, let's just say, Rick says, uh, let's just say that I personally know one of your former screener, screeners who has had an incredible career in this industry. That said, taxi has been validated for me. Yay. Um, how Ian says, how would that help anybody? Fake listings, crazy. Um, yeah. Darren says, cool, thanks to Mrs. Lasko. Um, yeah, she was even working that whole time that she was stuck in Israel. She was working on that project pretty much every day. Uh, Lisa Dunn, I'm pretty new to submitting for briefs. Whoa, that scrolled by quickly. Um, just curious, if I submitted something in May for a brief, do I still get feedback even if it doesn't make the cut? Um, can I pay for it? Yeah, if you submitted something in May, you have to look at, we don't start screening, generally speaking, until the deadline is passed. If it's something that's an extremely popular listing, that's got a ton of submissions and we can see they're coming in you know, at a pretty fast clip and in large numbers, uh, we may start screening before the deadline. Um, it doesn't mean that you, know, you could submit at 11.59 p.m. the day of the deadline and you will still get heard. Um, and you're at no, you know, running at no deficit by doing that. Um, we just get a jump on it because we have to meet a deadline on the other end when we send stuff to the industry. So if we were to wait, uh, you know, if we get in 422 submissions for a particular listing and we've only got two people that are expert in that genre, we know that they're each going to be doing a couple hundred of them. So we will let them start early so that we can still meet the deadline on the back end. And we don't send out the notifications uh, until after everything has been screened. Every single one of them has to have been screened. And generally, that takes about three weeks after the deadline. Could go 30 days. Um, there are exceptions where it goes a little bit longer. I mean, we've had, uh, for instance, uh, as a matter of fact, I had to get involved this morning in uh, a member that was complaining that so much of the material he was submitting under pop, like really high bar pop listings for major stars on major labels, 
um, that many of his critiques were done by the same person. Well, there was good reason for that, and that is we had two people that were great. You know, somebody who does pop for film and TV might not or probably won't be screening pop for records. They're both pop, but it's two different things. Um, the record screeners don't know about things like universal lyrics um, or what works with picture necessarily. And the people who screen pop for film and TV uh, look through a different lens than somebody who's screening pop for, you know, Britney Spears. <laughs> there you go. Um, anyway, th this guy was complaining, you know, that he'd had the same screener on a lot of his critiques. And uh, the answer was that the other person who did half the work uh, ended up going back to the UK right around the time that COVID started and uh, isn't working for us anymore. Um, good news is that one of our favorite all-time screeners, who is maybe the most multi-genre screener we've ever had under the roof, um, has recently come back to Taxi and... Uh, um, is also very adept at pop. And uh, I just uh, gave marching orders to the a &R department uh, about an hour ago saying, hey, why don't you guys reach out to our, our remaining unbelievably well-qualified pop person and the other unbelievably well-qualified pop person who went back to the UK and just say, hey, can you guys recommend two or three other people? Because um, now they know the job, so they, can, they know what would be expected of their friends. <clears throat> And to be honest here, I'll tell you, you know, kind of what the criteria is for us finding um, pop record screeners. Um, it would be somebody who is, <clears throat> excuse me, either a pop producer or a pop songwriter with some credits and recent credits. And they're probably still actively working in the industry, but they don't necessarily work 365 days a year. You know, they they have time off between projects, or they might have a lull in their career. Um, so you know, they come in and they work a taxi just to help pay the mortgage when they're between things. Let me get my little trackpad over here so I can scroll better. Um, uh, I just saw another one I wanted to answer, sorry. If you report, uh, if you report to us, you can say the company and, and you know, if we put it in the newsletter, we'll just take the company name out. And we're back to Britney Spears. Yes, we are. Uh, being part of Taxi is like belonging to an exclusive music club, like sharing the art of songwriting with others. I just found two cool and talented songwriters, which is one of the keys to success. Absolutely. Um, right. If you're going to post on the forum, don't mention the company names. That's actually one of the forum rules. If you're emailing us directly, you can say it was XYZ Library, and we'll just change it to you know, a popular music library or, you know, a really high-end music library, something like that. Uh, what screener number is the one that came back? Honestly, I don't know. Um, Taxi TV and the Quarantini Insights are worth the price of admission. Uh, Peter of... Uh, Cass is correct. He says, Peter, I've heard of a couple of times where listings receive zero submissions. It's true, you know... Um, Oh, what was it? We were looking for um, Romani music, which is basically like uh, gypsy-esque music. And I think that we had like practically none or possibly none on, on, you know, no submissions on some of those listings. It's an oddball genre. Um, question, how about when, screen, when members are scared to call a library back or sign a deal? Uh, what about that, Darren? Excuse me. Michael, how do you connect with other writers to connect with? Huh? <laughs> I don't understand that question either. Maybe I took a stupid pill this morning. Uh, I thought it was a vitamin. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, repost question for Peter Rahill. Do you keep track of the records, i.e. the most submits to a listing or the fewest uh, ones that ever get? Yeah, yeah, we have numbers on all that stuff. And, and frankly, you know, we sit down and we go through and we look at which listings get the most submissions because that tells us what our members want. So if we hit a dry spell, I'm going to go back to pop for a minute and let's go back to pop and Britney Spears. You know, <laughs> if we ran three Britney Spears type listings, you know, in the nine months prior and they all got big numbers, it's a clear sign to us that our members like to submit for those. So then we might go shake some trees to try and get uh, more of those listings because we want you guys to get what you want. Uh, wow, man, I gotta say, you guys are really active today. I think I took a stupid pill this morning. I think you guys might have taken something else. You know, by the way, I was feeling a little tired, so I just guzzled like a full tumbler of iced coffee. And it's just starting to kick in, so I'm gonna start talking really fast now. Uh, Yeah, the guests are awesome. Um, I don't think we've ever had a lame guest. Uh, clarification from Alex Dillon. If you want to co-write and find others to work with, so how do you find them? Is that the question, Alex? Because if it is, um, the best thing you can do is go on the taxi forum and become active with the other people on the forum. And pretty soon you'll get a feel just naturally, like you've gotten to know people in this chat room um, you'll get to know who does the kind of music that you want to work on and reach out to them and say, hey man, want to collaborate? We also do have a collaboration, uh, it's called Collaboration Corner, I believe, on the forum where you can say, hey, I'm a, I'm a pop writer that loves to write songs for Britney Spears. Um, anybody else want to work on that stuff with me? Um, Andre, Taxi has a good amount of flamenco playing members. I didn't know that. Um, Pete Mason asked, curious, is it worth submitting a return queue for a similar listing, say a month later? Is it still possible? Um, it will, where did it go? Uh, it, is it possible it'll reach the same screener who rejected the first submission and risk another return? Um, it's always possible, but Remember, it's not just that a screener likes or doesn't like your music or deems it good or bad. They, if they didn't forward it for the first submission, the first listing, um, they didn't forward it because it didn't work um, for what that listing asked for. It's probably a case of it didn't really fit what the listing asked for. So you may do a better job of having it fit for the next one. Now, if the feedback you got from the first screener on the first submission um, was something like, you know, your mix is not very strong um, or the, you know, the, the song form, uh, if you will, on your cue um, wasn't good or the stinger ending, you know, was actually a fade. If it, it's got problems like that, fix the problems um, before you submit it again. Um, Yes, Alex, uh, the collaboration corner is in the forum. Um, let, let people criticize and give up more education, understanding, and deals for the rest of us. Well, that would be true if it were competitive, but it's not competitive. You know, it's not like you guys are competing against each other. You're just trying to meet the quality bar and the stylistic bar. Um, Joseph Alonzo said, true, he posts on the forum and it really worked. It was an easy way to find co-writers and we are part of Taxi, so it is cool. It's true. You know what? If you were to reach out to the general universe looking for co-writers, you would not get the quality of people that you're going to get through Taxi because the other Taxi members like yourselves have been absorbing all this education vis-a-vis -vis Taxi TV, the road rally, the newsletter, the feedback they get you know, in the form of critiques. So you're automatically kind of like fishing in the right pond with the best fish. <laughs> See that? I brought it back to fishing. Um, okay, I'm catching up with you guys. Wow, you guys are posting a lot today. I like it. Keeps me busy. Um,
Rick Cabot, Podmore says, sorry, but I was bumped from recording at Ocean Way years ago because Britney was doing a new record. Uh, one of the guys on my team said, oh, well, we'd hate to interrupt that art. <laughs> Speaking of things uh, bumping into Britney Spears, true confession time. Do you know that Britney and I have actually bumped tushies? It's true. Uh, not far from where Deb and I live is a little, um, what do you call it, like an antique mall, you know, where there are all these uh, little antique booths within a larger building, and there's several of those stores all in one little area. And uh, I was in there, I think Deb and I were there on a Sunday, just, you know, walking around, looking to see, you know, it's like going to a museum for free. Um, but it's never for free because Deb always ends up buying anything that's like colored glass she loves, especially like green glass. Um, so she buys like little colored shot glasses and teacups and stuff. We have way too much of that stuff. And so she was off doing her thing and I was probably looking at like antique cameras or maybe even antique microphones or something. And it was in this tiny little corner that was like four feet by four feet, you know, and you're kind of surrounded by all this fragile stuff that you don't want to accidentally knock off of a shelf. And I was bending, kind of bent over looking at something. And uh, as I backed up to leave that tiny cramped little area, I bumped into this lady's butt and my butt touched her butt. And it was Britney Spears. But then again, she lives... Uh, you know, we're so incredibly wealthy that our mansion is right down the street from Britney's. <laughs> Not true. Um, she lives at least two miles away. <laughs> no, I'm just being goofy now. Um, yeah, we don't live in a mansion. Um, I would say that Britney lives like five minutes from the taxi office and probably like I don't know, 12 to 15 minutes away from where we live. So not that uh, unusual that I would bump into her um, at the little antique mall. But now we know something extra about Britney Spears. We know that she likes antiques. Um, wow, I am having a hard time keeping up with you guys. Am I familiar? Hey, Ruben, uh, are you familiar with Musicians Institute? I am. I'm very familiar with them. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Rich Ezra, who was on the show yesterday, I believe, still teaches at Am I? Um, Pierre wants to know, just submitted a song for custom critique. How long does it take in average to get it back? Usually 30 days. Those we're a little slower on those because there are only certain screeners that we feel are, are well qualified to take that deeper dive. I shouldn't say that. They're, they're all qualified to give the feedback, actually really well qualified. But some of the screeners um, who are, what's the word I'm looking for? Verbose, more verbose than others. Um, possibly uh, even better communicators. Um, those tend to be the people that we then train specifically to do the customs. But because we don't get that many requests for customs, uh, we will let a few of them accumulate. So when the screener comes in, he or she um, can do a bunch of them at the same time rather than doing like one today and one next Thursday and one two days after that. So it can take a little while, but usually 30 days. Um, things are a little squirrely right now. Honestly, uh, as much as the staff has been performing incredibly well working remotely, um, here's a great example of how things can get messed up because of the COVID. Uh, I went to the office sometime last week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of last week to water my one and only plant. Um, and when I came out of the building, one of the maintenance guys that our office is in a complex of three like medium sized two and three story office buildings. Uh, and, and so there are two maintenance people and we all know them and we all like them. And I ran into uh, one of the guys, Luis, out in the parking lot and he goes, oh, man, I, I've got a package for you from FedEx. And I went. OK, he goes, let me go get it. So he went to one of the other buildings, went up to the main rental office. They'd been holding it there. I don't know why. Maybe the FedEx guy left it leaning up against the office door. It's probably the case. And Luis, being the good guy that he is, knows that we weren't at the office. So he took it to the rental office so it wouldn't get jacked. And so, you know, probably a week or two after, maybe could have, could have been five weeks, I don't know. But I think it was like a week or so, uh, he handed me the FedEx. I promptly put it in the back seat of my car 
and I meant to give it to, the, I'm sure it was a, probably a CD for um, one of the customs or somebody that doesn't know how to upload music or something for whatever reason. Um, it was FedEx to us. I put it in my car and I meant to give it to Matt uh, from our office when he was at our house the other day uh, for the Bria going away party and I forgot to give it to him. But the good news is my wife actually borrowed a jar of mayonnaise from Matt and he is coming by our house tomorrow, Friday, uh, because he's heading into the office for something. Um, and so he's gonna pick up the, uh, the misplaced uh, FedEx from me. I'm gonna take it out of my car and put it by our front door right after the show. Uh, and then Deb will repay him his jar of Hellman's mayonnaise. There you go. Here's an interesting factoid you may not know. Hellman's mayonnaise was invented on the Upper West Side of New York. Check it out, it's true. Here's another thing you may not know unless you live in California. You cannot buy Hellman's mayonnaise in California. Out here it's called Best Foods. Same thing, same jar, slightly different label, completely different name. Uh, okay, let me catch up with you guys. Um, Man, oh man, it freaks me out when I hear my computer straining like this. Uh, that's right, when I bumped into Brittany, I said, hit me baby one more time. That's exactly right, Lisa. <laughs> uh, yep, it is labeled Best Foods here. Uh, recently submitted, this is from Robert Martin, who recently submitted to a drone listing. Listener said it fit listing, but output, output volume was wrong. Said it should be mastered uh, at 14 lufs, 1 dB true peak. Could you speak to recording level? No. Um, honestly, I am at a loss because, as you guys probably are aware, I haven't done anything in the studio in a very long time. Back in my day, almost everything was done on VU meters. My SSL did have um, like the, the plasma VU meters. Ballistically, they looked like a view meter, but they were in fact, you know, the up and down uh, vertical meters. Um, and they were pretty true as far as how they felt compared to, you know, this kind of VU meter. Um, you could switch to peak mode and, and things that I, you know, like I had some two tracks that you could switch to peak reading mode and cassette player um, and maybe some outboard stuff. But I am absolutely convinced after watching a lot of stuff on YouTube that whatever the standard was for the peak reading meters back in my day is not what it is now. And so much uh, has changed in that regard since everything has gone into the digital domain that I am not expert on um, what the levels should be uh, on meters today. But I can tell you, you can absolutely get the answer to this question by going to the Taxi Forum at forums with an S, forums.taxi.com. Um, and ask that question, you, there's probably, I think there's a recording and technology sec section. If not, just ask it in the, the general section. There will be 20 people that will know the answer to that. Um, while we're on the topic of level, I can't believe it's 438 already. Wow. Um, while we're on the topic of levels, one thing I will tell you that I frequently see when we have a bunch of music that um, is like stuff that we pull for Taxi TV. When we build a playlist for Taxi TV of forwards and returns, uh, it's really obvious that, you know, probably five to 10% of the stuff, the, the levels are really low. Um, it's probably not a criminal offense, um, but the problem is if we send it out to the receiving company at that incredibly low level and everything else on the playlist uh, and it's most of the other stuff all seems to be at a good healthy level and a similar level the you know the few things that are lower level um they just sound lifeless and quiet and you literally have to boost the volume for that one a lot of people in the industry believe it or not are a little lazy they won't bother boosting the level they'll just skip to the next one um
if you have very specific mastering specs, do you put those in the listings? I don't recall seeing them. I don't think anybody has ever um, given us any you know, mastering specs that they wanted us to put in the listing. Um, Darren Moss, Michael, Neil Young just put out a 70s lost album. Did you work on that or any of the stuff on his archive series? Um, honestly, I haven't looked at the archive series. I know it's out there. I haven't had time to check it out. Uh, and I was unaware of the lost album stuff from the 70s. I wouldn't be surprised if some of the stuff that I worked on um, is on there. Um, speaking of which, uh, here, I'll give you some inside dirt. So uh, I worked with Neil Young at Triad Recording in Fort Lauderdale, I want to say around 1976-ish, maybe 77. Um, I mean, there were two or three times where he came and stayed for, you know, either a few weeks or a couple of months or a few months at a time. And it was spread out over, like on and off over a period of probably close to a year. Um, and he would record stuff. Anybody that's worked with Neil knows that he records stuff kind of whenever he gets the inspiration. So he could record at his ranch. Um, he's got a studio and a barn. Um, ranch that he used to have. I don't think he... He doesn't live there anymore. He lives somewhere around me now, you know, somewhere in Southern California, um, like north of uh, the actual city of Los Angeles. Anyway, he would record stuff with me. Then he'd go record stuff at his ranch. Then he might you know, have been out here, you know, in Southern California playing a gig and decided to go to, I don't know, let's see, Carib or not Caribou Studios, uh, I can't remember the name of the place in Malibu that he went to every now and then. So when he came back to me, he would oftentimes have 24 track masters from other cities uh, and other time periods that he would bring with him. And yeah, you know, we'd be working on the song Comes a Time, maybe, you know, from a fresh start. It was like a brand new song and a new recording of it, first time he recorded it. And uh, when he got tired of working on that one, he might pull out a, a two inch that he'd worked on two years ago at his ranch and say, oh, hey now, that's my Neil Young imitation. Um, hey now, uh, what do you think? Should we work on this song? Uh, throw it up on the machine, you know? And I'd put it up on the machine and say, Neil, that song's incredible. Yeah, let's work on it. And we would. Um, so all that said, once Comes a Time was wrapped um, and Neil was not coming back to my studio at any point in the near future, and as it turned out, never again, because at some point, a couple of years after that, I moved to New York and left that studio. Um, the two inch masters from a lot of stuff were sitting on the shelves in our tape vault and uh, studios are actually required. I don't know if it's a law, but it's certainly kind of a business ethic that when somebody wraps an album and they leave masters or even two inch outtakes, whatever tapes are living in your tape storage vault or facility, um, you let the, the record label know that you've got the stuff. We would catalog it, we would send a letter, um, return receipt requested so that we did our legal duty and say we've got you know, 16 reels of two inch with these songs on it recorded on these dates. We've got quarter inch mixes of blah, 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 blah. Um, and about 80% of the time labeled right back and say, okay, send us a PO number for how much you think it's gonna cost to crate it and ship it. Um, and insure it and we would crate the stuff up and ship it to the label so that they could store it in their facility. Um, in the case of that Neil Young stuff, uh, Warner Brothers never responded and, and those two inches and, and probably some quarter inch mixes sat in that room for a couple of years after I left and the guy who was my then business partner and probably best friend in the world uh, when the when he left the studio, the studio eventually closed down. When he left, he took those tapes home and put them in a closet at his house, which was outside of Philadelphia eventually. Uh, and then at some point he got divorced and left the Philadelphia area and took the tapes with him to his house on the west coast of Florida. Uh, and then about two years ago, I found out that he had terminal cancer just a few days left. Uh, and he and I spoke on the phone for what was obviously a tear-jerking conversation. And I said to him, do you still have those tapes? He goes, yeah, I do. 
And I said, well, uh, you got to get them either to me or to Warner Brothers or to somebody, you know, who's in the industry that will make sure that, you know, don't let them get sold at a garage sale. And uh, luckily, his daughter, who I knew since birth, grew up to be a lovely young lady. And she recently, about two and a half years ago, um, married uh, a mixer, um, a, a big engineer mixer guy, and they live in Nashville. So I got on the phone with the, my friend's daughter and asked her to grab that stuff from the house um, so that it would be safely stored. So that's all I know about it for now, but there you go. So, you know, uh, maybe there's another Neil Young 70s record on, on those reels. I don't know, I haven't looked at them in like 40 years. Um, okay, I'm gonna, try and get caught up with you guys uh, yeah Pete Mason says Neil Young is a huge audiophile hi-fi sound quality guy he co-wrote a book about it titled uh, to feel the music here's the ironic part uh, wow you guys are so busy today um, Let's just say that back in my day, Neil and Bob Dylan were well known for recording records that were pretty rough and tumble. As I've told you many times, Neil was all about capturing the vibe and the performance and really didn't care that much about audio quality. He used to joke about it. He said to me, you know, me and Bob Dylan, man, uh, audio verite. Uh, and he said it sarcastically with a little, you know, kind of a Jack Nicholson wink. Um, and uh, so I found it funny when I became aware that Neil was all of a sudden becoming really concerned. But you know what? He would still, I guarantee you, Neil would still do kind of the lo-fi, rough, seat-of-the-pants performance. And if it captured the essence of what he wanted to convey with that song, he would just make sure when he talks about, you know, high-quality audio, he would want it to sound like it sounded in the studio, even though it may have been a rough recording. As I mentioned, there were plenty of times where Neil would just strap on his Martin and walk around the room. It was a pretty big room. It was like 43 feet deep, 25 wide. And Neil would just walk around the room kind of, you know, like free-forming it. And my poor assistant, Paul Kaminsky, may he rest in peace, um, would pick up an 87, you know, on a boom and follow him around and just try and stay within like two feet of him to make sure that we captured it. Um, Rick says, don't be selfish, Michael, our day. You're old too. <laughs> um, I think that's what you're referring to. Um, okay, I think I'm caught up. Nothing else to answer, which is kind of good because the suspense is killing us um which suspense i should reach out to neil young bet he'd be interested uh you know um frankly because the tapes were never in my possession um i didn't reach out to him but encouraged my uh now deceased friend and, and business partner to do so um, at least now I'm, I'm pretty sure they're stored in a safe place in Nashville. Um, but yeah, you know, I, um, I don't have his home phone number anymore. I just found an old phone book of mine though, that had like four numbers for Neil in there, but it was back long before cell phones existed. Um, I should reach out to his management company, Elliot Roberts and let him know. Neil Young's website is really cool. Johnny and the Tipper Z. Uh, it's John Pearson. Oh, hey, John. How's your vacation going? Wow, must not be going that great if you're hanging out with us. <laughs> uh, question from Peter Rahill. Do you think Neil would think Taxi is goofy? I don't know. Uh, I'm thinking. Um, no, I think once he got the explanation and found out how much help the we give to musicians, I think he'd think it's cool. Um, I've often thought about having him do the road rally with me, um, but 
I'm not so sure. I mean, people think it's cool because I'd be interviewing Neil and I'd certainly be comfortable interviewing him. Um, there'd certainly be a walk down memory lane, that's for sure. But, you know, he is so not like anybody else in the industry that I just get. So, Neil, how do you write a hit song? I don't know. Uh, I just write whatever comes to me, man. I don't care if it's a hit would be the answer. I made your wife laugh, John. <laughs> That's good, as long as she's laughing at me and not at you, right? <laughs> Rick says, Neil Young is goofy. He's actually, uh, he, he likes to joke around. There is something about Neil that absolutely reminds me of Jack Nicholson when he's being goofy. Um, when Neil, Neil can make that kind of wry-looking, raised eyebrow Jack Nicholson face he doesn't try and imitate jack nicholson it's just you know the face that he owns and it turns out that way um have i seen the recent documentary laurel canyon very cool you know i started it and didn't finish it maybe i'll do that on saturday that's a great idea can't believe it's 451 man I'm glad you guys had a lot of talk, you know, a lot of stuff to talk about today because I really didn't have much other than being pissed off. Um, are there any taxi, any artists that are taxi members, the caliber of Neil Young? We have many artists that are taxi members that I think are great. Is there, a, you know, when you say the caliber of Neil Young, that's kind of hard to equate because Neil is you know, so kind of, you know, where, where's that level? Where's the bar for Neil Young, you know? And there's so many Neil Youngs within Neil Young. He, you know, he could be, um, you know, working with a, a stack of marshals, you know, and his black, um, excuse me, you know, his black Gibson and, and doing like, in, you know, like punk, um, one minute and doing acoustic stuff the next minute and so you never really know I, I don't have any there's not a Neil Young bar uh, and frankly he is such a one of a kind you know artists like that that are like true 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 artists that just don't give a damn about what anybody thinks they make music because they love what they write they love to create and they just don't care very few people can say that um, can I invite Pat Boone on the show without the birthday suit? Honestly, it's been so long since I've spoken to him. You know, he'd probably remember the road rally, but hey, Pat, can you come on Taxi TV? You know, I mean, we've got one, uh, Michael Lloyd is a very close friend of mine. He's also a close friend and the across the street neighbor of Michael Lloyd. I guess it wouldn't be 100% out of the question. Um, Darren Moss is disappointed that I'm in a great mood, not pissed off at all, not as advertised. Well, I was really cranky when I started the show, Darren. <laughs> yep, that's what made the band so special, too. Yeah, you know, we had Robbie Robertson. He was a great interview, man. Great subject for an interview. Really, really smart man. Very articulate. Um, Mark Reel, third time's charm. Do you ever get a cue submission request for music with a live feel? Uh, I'm sure we've probably had a few, um, not that many. Uh, Michael hasn't seen my note, my favorite story. Norman Rosenfield, do you think you could get Pat Boone to come on and interview Neil Young? Neil would probably like that. How long does it take you and your staff to prepare for the road rally? Um, it's largely Angel and my wife that, and myself um, that start out a few months before. Um, staff members do outbound calls to members, reminding them about the road rally, alerting them to when it's happening. Um, while Angel is busy taking care of lining up all the mentors and class teachers, I'm busy coming up with the ideas, the, the concepts and the structure for the panels, then figuring out who I want on the panels. Then I start calling them and inevitably when I call them, I usually call versus emailing. Um, they always say, yeah, man, that sounds cool. Uh, reach out to me a couple weeks before and I'll let you know. 
no, I, I've got to know now so that we can put your name, you know, in all the printed materials and all the online stuff. Oh man, well, it's tough to say. I don't know if I'm going to be busy then or not. Dude, just make a friggin' commitment. So it's like pulling teeth and herding. It's like pulling teeth out of the cats that you're trying to herd. Um, herd with a D, not hurt with a T. Um, so it, it's tough. It takes a lot of time. And then inevitably somebody bows out because they can't do it. It's you know Saturday at four o'clock. Can you move the panel to Friday at two o'clock? Well, I can, but that means I've got to reach out to the people who are doing the panel Friday at two o'clock and see if they mind moving to Saturday or Sunday at four o'clock. And then I've got to see if everybody else on your panel, you know, doesn't mind being moved. Uh, all those little things. So it takes a while. It takes months. Um, will there be a rally? Will there be a rally? Will there be a rally? Um, you know, as recently as last night at 11 p.m., I was emailing uh, back to our sponsor person who was saying, you know, maybe you should do a hybrid rally, you know, where you have rooms with big monitors where if people can't fit in a class, you've got overflow and blah, blah, blah. That just makes it harder than ever. You know, first of all, all, all that AV stuff is really expensive. Yeah, we could go buy a bunch of like, you know, 60 inch TVs at Costco for probably way cheaper than we could rent them. Um, but just running, you know, having the ability to broadcast that stuff, Bluetooth it or whatever we would do to get it to overflow rooms. Do we have to run cables? <clears throat> Who's going to be in charge of the tech? We've got 10 classes running. How many of those uh, classes have to have overflow rooms? Well, if we've got overflow rooms, that means we can't probably have the 10 classes. So now we have to knock it down to five classes, which means the overflow is going to be even bigger. Uh, has the mayor given a green light? Well, we are allowed, allowed to go back to the office and we are going back to the office on Monday the 29th. And I still haven't made up my mind if there's any way that I could keep doing these Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday shows. Uh, you know, I enjoy them as much as you do. I'm sure we bring a lot of great information to you guys, mostly about fishing. Um, so, I want to keep doing them, but I got to tell you, it's hard. Uh, it's not that hard coming up with ideas for the show because you guys have been carrying a lot of the water on that lately, which I really appreciate. But, um, you know, it cuts into my day. Um, I, I, I owe Ariana a bunch of edits on a series of six emails, and it's the kind of thing where I have to be really focused and look at little details and really think it through so I can't just go, okay, I've got 20 minutes before the show starts, uh, oh, and then here's the return phone call from the video editor. So that's going to take 20 minutes. Nope, can't do it today. So all these little things that disrupt things that have to be done, one of those things is doing the show. Then again, the benefit of doing the show is I learn more about you, our members, um, and you learn more about the industry and taxi, so it's hard to walk away from that. Joseph Alonzo is going to wear a t-shirt with an open plaid shirt and go as Michael to the rally. Yeah, that's one thing Neil, and, Neil Young and I had in common is uh, we would show up to the studio pretty much every day, even in 90 degree, you know, Miami weather. I still wore flannel shirts and t-shirts a lot. It's my thing. And plus when you're working in a cold, dark studio, you know, you have to keep them cold to keep the equipment cool. Um, always good to have a flannel around, but yeah, this is how I dress. Um, uh, so yeah, we're allowed, technically we were allowed to go back to our office this past Monday. So things are st starting to open back up, but you know, of course now we're hearing about uh, spikes in Florida and Georgia and some in Texas, some of the states that opened earlier. Um, but as I pointed out to staff yesterday, uh, I can't remember where it was. I think it, maybe it was one of the counties in California. We've seen a 200% increase in hospitalizations. When you read further into it, it was like, you know, we had two people in the hospital with COVID last week. This week we've got, you know, four people or eight people for the math would be on that. So you got to read beyond the headlines. So, you know, all I can tell you is we want to do it. And, uh, you know, I've got to know in the next month if we're going to be allowed to do it. 
And then uh, I do not want to do like classes with less people and spillover rooms with video. Oh, and then the sponsor guy, of course, his motivation is he just wants to sell sponsorships. Um, so I can't let him dictate uh, how the road rally is executed. But man, oh man, having classes that are half empty with um, monitors in another room for spillover, which would um, be clunky at best. And then he said, and you could have people in there um, taking questions from the audience in the spillover room and texting them back to the person uh, teaching the class in the other room. No, no, not gonna do that. Um, <laughs> Pete Mason says, young daughter's curious how many plaid shirts I own. Um, I could tell you that I own four flannel shirts right now that fit. Um, you know, flannels are funny. Sometimes you get one. I, I tend to buy them XL um, so that they continue fitting even after they shrink or I gain weight. Um, but flannel shirts tend to, to shrink in the arms. So I've got some that fit me fine in the shoulders and fine around you know the middle section. Um, but the sleeves are, have shrunk. So now like they're up to my elbows. I, I don't get that. Even like I've got a, a Ralph Lauren flannel that I paid like a hundred dollars for probably 25 years ago. It's a great flannel. One of my all time favorites. The sleeves are literally almost up to the elbows. Yet the rest of the shirt is fine. Um, Yeah, maybe I'll do the quarantine a couple days a week. I don't know. Uh, I will tell you this, that I have personally resolved and, and we're, our time is just, it's over. Oh, and Mrs. Lasko is pulling into the garage now. I can hear that. Um, if we don't end up doing a road rally, in the hotel because it's just logistically impossible or the governor says, no, we can't, or the mayor says, no, we can't. I promise you at a bare minimum, what I will do is put together really great, um, kind of like taxi TV stuff um, for the number of days and the number of hours that the road rally would normally run. So, you know, like Friday, all day Friday, all day Saturday and all day Sunday, I will do back to back to back um, panels, quote unquote, on taxi TV. Um, of course, the, the unknown thing is how well, it, I would love to be able to do a Zoom panel and uh, it, it's just different people have different upload, you know, upstream bandwidth. And I, I would hate to do a panel where every time, you know, panelist number four starts talking, it's like uh, 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 Max Headroom. Um, yeah, 10 hours live quarantini rallies with guests. Uh, you know, you have my word that if we can't do a physical rally, we will do that. Um, Florida had over 3,000 virus case increase today. Yes, but hospitalizations and deaths are actually down. So I think there's a certain amount of truth to the fact that, yeah, the, you know, the number of people um, being identified as having it is because the function we're testing a lot more people. So I personally choose to look at are the, you know, is the death rate going down, which is awesome if it does, um, and hospitalizations. But I haven't heard anything about any state being over or any hospital anywhere being overburdened. And wasn't that the big fear? Isn't that why we had to flatten the curve so that every patient who needed a bed had one? And look what happened in New York, you know, um, Samaritan's Purse, set up that awesome um, hospital in, in Central Park, barely had anybody in it. Um, President Trump sent uh, whatever the name of the ship was, one to LA, I think, and one to New York City. Um, the Navy hospital ships, they barely had any people. In New York, they took the Jacob Javits Center and put a couple thousand hospital beds in there, barely had any people in it. And that was when, oh no, it's a peak. You know, the world is coming to an end and I don't mean to make light of it. But none of that stuff that people anticipated really manifested. So I choose to personally watch how many people are ending up in hospital beds and how many people are dying. All that, I will say that, um, yeah, my wife is home. Come on in, Deb. <laughs> uh, 
yeah, testing is great, but it is just a snapshot. It is, but if you're testing, you know, more people and ongoing testing, at least it gives you some sort of metric. Um, Samaritan's Purse, great organization. Yeah, but they tried to kick them out of New York uh, afterwards because they were observant religious people and a uh, certain number of people in New York didn't like that. And it's like, get out of here. Well, geez, they showed up and, and brought them a hospital. You know, how that didn't seem all that nice. <laughs> people are saying, hello, Deb. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I've got to end it now. We're five minutes over. My wife is home. Time to start cooking dinner. There she is. She's dressed for going bird watching. <laughs> She's got on her bird watching vest. Um, all right, you guys, got to wrap it up for today. Uh, taxi mom, yep. Uh, thank you for asking a bunch of great questions today. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. I am now going to um, fire up the grill and start prepping dinner right after I do a little more end of day taxi work. And I will see you guys tomorrow for another exciting episode of Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour. And don't forget to let us, about, let us know about those deals so that I'm not pissed off. Bye, you guys. Where's my audience? There they are. Bye. See ya.